I think my own personal struggle sometimes with the balance stuff is, um, you know, if I'm doing a hobby or I'm sitting to read a book, you know, my wife pours through books. And in, in the back of my mind, you know, my social media feed is, you know, David Goggins just ran a uh, hundred miles in the heat. Uh, Cameron Haynes just ran 20 miles every single day. Um, and I, I, I sometimes feel that some of the things that I might be doing, I should be doing something more or different. You know, I see Mo having written how many papers that, uh, and I think, okay, well, I got to do that too. And, and I got, so I, I'll be, and I'm being totally honest. I have problems sometimes just reading the book without thinking of the stuff that I should be doing. And then I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. It's very non-Zen. <laughs> so <laughs> what's, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the counterpoint to that? And I don't know if anybody else feels like that. But. Uh, well, I think, I think if I can jump in, I think one thing you're articulating, um, which is interesting, right? You're, you're, you're articulating something I think is what we all feel is you feel that everyone else is finding a way to balance except you. And the more you look at the outside world, you find more fault with yourself rather than making the sense that most people out there, you know, good for them that they're doing it, but you know, you, you've got to put your own house in order, so to speak. And I think it's a fundamental point. I mean, I think both Vinny and Fabio brought this point across is most of us never think of preventative strategies. You can th think of it the same as anything else we do in our, in our field, right? We say we want to prevent osteoporotic fractures, but we end up as orthopedic surgeons treating more than we're preventing. And prevention strategies, unfortunately, still recall in a lot of burnout in our field. So the fact that we're even discussing it is a good thing. Um, but let me ask um, some of the folks here, um, anyone who's sort of checked in here, when you think about plateaus, most of us get to a point of plateau and then we start figuring out how we're going to get out of it. Can you get out of a very deep, deep, difficult situation? I mean, is that a possibility? Is that a, is that a, um, or do you have to get help to do that? I mean, you know, like some of these things we think, well, we can just fix things. When do you need help? At what point do you feel you need to have a team around you? You mentioned Fabio, you were the, you know, you are the average of the five people. Well, there are probably at least five other people who could be mentoring and supporting you. When do you get them involved? You, you want me to address? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, uh, I totally agree. Like there's a point that you need to get people involved. I, I think majorly it's when you are stuck uh, for a, a good long period of time that you cannot uh, move forward any, anymore. You are procrastinating and you are feeling uh, depressed and this is already impacting only, not only in your productivity or success, but in fact is also in, impacting in the way that you are carrying your patients, in the way uh, that you are dealing with your, your friends. So I, I feel that there is a, a, a very uh, tiny line between being healthy and not being healthy. And uh, uh, you should like, uh, in my opinion, you should find work or try to find work as soon as possible. Because once you're very deep, it's gonna need a lot of work, a lot of protection, a lot of support and mentorship to get out of it. But if you look for uh, support and help, as soon as you feel that you're not being your, like your best, you're not uh, uh, able to deliver uh, or do the things that uh, you would like to do. And, and, and one thing that I add to that is that it's the neighbor uh, grass is always greener. So meaning that uh, you need to focus in doing your best and, and, and trying to achieve that. And, and that I, I think it's, it's the key point. Uh, maybe, Go ahead, Vinny. Uh, maybe one thing that Fabio has said in the second lesson is that you have to do uh, one little effort, one little task every day. So this is a way that, uh, as Brad said, it's not, it's okay like to read uh, like 20 pages of the book just on Sunday and you spend like six months to, to read the book. You are just, just, just moving forward in your, in your speed. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, even if you are like in a deep, in a deep situation, 
uh, if you are moving some in some some way, you don't need help. You just need some some time to get motivated to focus on one thing that can make you uh, feel better. Let me. I mean, uh, I know there's a few people on video here. You know, the point we're raising um, is the following: we all know, or we all, everyone thinks they can get better, right? We all think we can do just a little bit more. Um, and the question is. Some of us get in the mindset of, well, I, you know, I won't even start because if I, you know, because just simply to start means I have all this work to do to get to a certain place. And you know what? I'll just put it off. I'll do something that's easy. We use the simple example of research and clinical. You use that a good example, right? Research and clinical. The following is, and, and as you said, someone's, someone's Catholic practice, they're working away. They mentally and emotionally want to do research because they believe it's a good thing and they think it'll give them joy and it's an academic adventure. But they, they procrastinate. Um, the quality of the work is poor. They never get around to it. They're, you know, they're just, it's never getting done. And I think that fear happens where, well, if I, it's too hard now. I just can't get started. Um, and then you get into that emotional state, right? I, I see it. I mean, I, I work with people all the time who have this real difficulty with balancing on just the, on the work, on the academic side. And I guess the question I put forth to, you know, to, to those of you, I mean, you know, there's, there's many here who are thinking, I know there's some here who are earlier career. What's your take on this? When you look at the future, how much of it is overwhelming for some of you to think about and how are you managing and what tactics are you using? I know I see Mark, I see Prob there, you know. And don't, don't worry, Mark, he's talking about me, just so you know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I I'm going to wait for Brad at the end. I'm going to, I'm going to let Brad, I want Brad to let us sink in. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit. Um, I, I won't uh, acknowledge that that was directed at me. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm kidding, right? um, yeah, I, I, I think the, I don't know for, for me, I, I, I think there's a, a scale that is very important of acknowledging when you've, taken on too much quickly instead of like you said it's easy to say you know i'll get through it i'll get through it and things just drag on and then like you said it turns into a disaster that's went on for a year longer without anything sort of having moved forward and i think you know there's a fine line between early sort of in your career wanting to take on as much as you can and you know get all of this experience but being able to sort of critically realize you know when you're becoming inefficient like there's a line of being a very full schedule and then moving to just inefficient i think that's and to be honest it's something you know i'm still trying to learn and figure out myself but i find that line always is the the thing that you is important to kind of figure out for yourself to to acknowledge pretty quickly when things are, are too much so that you don't get in that scenario that you're talking about. But there, I, go ahead, there, bro. Sorry, Mo, is, can there be a fear of saying no to, uh, you know, a fear that oh, if I say no to whoever, I'm, they're, they're not going to ask me to do it again. And because uh, <clears throat> I know I felt that myself, I, I better say yes to this. And, and I know it's going to, I might not be happy, but I got to do it. What about you guys? Like, is that a component or? For sure, it, it of course it's definitely a thing. Like that's definitely something that happens for me anyway. I'm not sure if others. Well, I mean, there's a concept of, um, and we're, we're we're tilting a bit to burnout, right? But it's always the, um, you know, the here's here's the unfortunate part of everything, right? And and Vinny and Fabio, if we're if we're veering off track, please let us know and get us back on track because we're trying to stay focused on it. And anyone here, Diane, I see you thinking about stuff. So if you have something you want to bring up, please get us back. Sergio, anybody, Luke, anybody. But, um, um, but the point is uh, we often, we often have a situation, right? Where we are trying, people will often give you work if you have lots of things on the go. The people that look with the most on the go tend to get more. Those with nothing on the go get nothing because the perception is, well, they're never going to get it done. And so it becomes an unfortunate self-fulfilling prophecy that the more you say yes and the more you deliver, the more you get and the more potential 
stress you have on yourself. And then you get into the point where uh, Vinny says, you know, you're, you're trying to organize your family, you're trying to organize clinical, you're trying to do research, you're trying to do everything. And my perception is you can't be all things to everybody. And at best, you can probably do two out of three things well. And that's at best, right? They're just, it's just impossible. So that's the sacrifice I think that we all have to make. And it's really, really hard. I'd love to hear that. I means. think, uh, oh, okay. Rook, yeah. Pig, piggybacking on what Mark said, like myself as a trainee, um, there's some important topics that you guys are all bringing up. Um, I think I've actually ended up taking a page out of your book, Dr. Bandari. You posted about your vision statements that you write to yourself. I think that's been very important for me. Dr. Petrosor mentioned that you lose sight when you start comparing yourself to some of your peers or the people around you. And it's important to set your own goals and it can be fear provoking sometimes when you're trying to set your own path because your specific goals are specific to yourself, but having those vision statements and those goals can help you become more efficient and then reach those goals in those individual kind of um, silos of your life, whether it be family. And I think that, that uh, the lessons that you pick up even from people through their own, um, like your social media and stuff like that, those can be important to keep you on the right track as well. So let me ask you this, has anybody else, so Luke, it sounds like you've thought about putting together a vision statement. You don't have to tell us what it is, but, but you've gone through that mental thought process of doing it. Can you, um, can you explain a little bit more to others um, who may not have applied this strategy, um, what, you, what you take of it? So forget about what I say, but what, what do you take from that experience of even thinking about that? Yeah, I think, well, to be honest, it started, I remember when I was in medical school or preparing for medical school interviews, classic question is, where do you see yourself in five years? And I always spun that question and answered it in the way I don't necessarily have a five-year plan. I know where I want to be with my future. I want to have A, a stable family, B, a research practice, and then C, being on my way to being a quality surgeon, clinician, whatever that is. And then kind of teasing those three facets of my life apart a little more. What does that family balance look like? What does that physical health look like? Um, and keeping it short and having an idea. So for me currently, it's being a good resident in the present, but also working towards my career aspirations of being, you know, a strong community slash academic arthroplasty surgeon and having that vision. So when I say yes and potentially say no to things and put things on my plate, does it move me towards that academic and clinical goal? And then does do those, those endeavors also fit with the balance that I, that I want to have that um, it's tough when you're a resident, but also still being able to be physically fit and spending time with the people that support you in your academic clinical endeavors. So I think that maintaining a, a three-pronged approach and, and referring back to that when you are in those clouded situations are important. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is, and I'll, I'll, I'll let others certainly give your, your viewpoints on this, is it's very difficult at times to be brutally honest on your own statements. You know, was, what you happens is, is you start living the vision statement you think other people want you to have rather than the one you actually want. And so when you're answering the five-year plan, ask yourself, is this the plan they want to hear or is this the plan I actually want? And th that becomes the real difference uh, between this. And I presume that when you have this document, this 50 words or 25 words, whatever those are, that, you know, that I think Fabio, um, that both Vinny and Fabio have talked about, you, you articulate it. Anytime something opens a door or something happens, you just say, is this opportunity consistent with what I believe in myself and what those things, and if it doesn't, you've got to say no. You've got to say no. I don't know, Brad, uh, uh, Vinny, uh, Fabio, anyone else? Yeah. No, but I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, at the end of the day as well, I mean, our, our statements include those around us, right? And how, I guess, how do, you how do you not incorporate things that you don't think that you kind of should do? Do you know what I mean? Like, how, 
Well, I mean, there's things that you should do as a, as a family member, as a, like, you know, there's always expectations. How, how do you not incorporate some of those? Yeah, I mean, I'm, again, I'm happy not to make this just about me and you, Brad, but we, we can- I would like love to see your vision. <laughs> I know, I have one, I have one, I have one. Uh, come to my lecture tomorrow and on Thursday, <laughs> and you'll, you'll get it, guys, you'll get it. But, um, but the point is, um, the reality is, at the end of the day, and this is something that I've talked to tons of social worker, my, my partner's a social worker, she tells me all the time. She says, she goes, if you can't sort your own stuff out, you cannot be a good enough human being to help others. You know, we sometimes say we're going to help everybody else, but we're not going to sort ourselves out in some way, however you do that. And if you can't do that, you can't be there for other people, Brad. I don't know. I don't know if you... Oh, I hear you. Yeah. And so when you hear about Vinny and Fabio talking about all these things, it rings true. You've got to find some balance for yourself and how you prioritize things and move on. I'm curious what other people think, please. You know, others, I'm sure by now have something that is resonating with you or not. If you agree or disagree, please share with us. Ah, it's Fabio here. So I, I think one of the, the key things is learning how to say no. Sometimes it's difficult when you are a junior, but it's, it's better to say no than saying yes and don't deliver. So that's even worse when you say yes and you don't achieve it. So uh, in my view, I, I felt that uh, saying no, it's something that I had to learn and I learned it in a hard way because I had too much on my plate. And then I said like, now I need to start saying no, even if it's a great opportunity, now I can't get anything extra in this plate because it's gonna broke. This is number one. And number two is having, as I said, like small pockets every day. So I have my, my task list for the day and I only have three things that I, I need to achieve on that day. And the number one, it's always the most difficult one, that the, the one that is going to take me more time because we tend to put like one, two, three, or five very easy tasks and put the, the number five, the most difficult one. So you can procrastinate and say, oh, I did four, so that one I'll do tomorrow. So always start with the most difficult one because then when I'm done with that, I feel that I have accomplished. If it's like 2 p.m. and then I'm leaving the hospital at four, I can bike, I can tennis, I can run because I did the most difficult one. And then the easy ones, they just go in 10 minutes. So that's a way that I found that helped myself very much. That's good. You know, you know that I feel a little bit like, like Brad, that uh, sometimes when you want something in your career, like you're like planning something five years in the future, then if you say no, to some activities, to something that you, yeah, I'm saying, especially in the academic perspective. So you say no at that point, you know that that thing is gonna uh, uh, make your, lose lots of energy on that. However, if you don't accept, you're not going to achieve the thing in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how to, to balance and to deal with that. And this is something that can make your career really stuck in it sometime. Yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting thing, right? Um, have any of you ever tried this? Um, asked three or four people to brutally, be brutally honest with you and, and write down what they feel uh, your brand is. So when you talk about something, you know, I, I think, I don't know who brought that up. I think it was you, Fabio, who brought it up, um, who said, you know, someone, uh, you never want to be the person who promises but never delivers. Some of those people actually don't have insight that they're doing that, and some do. But when you ask someone and say, yeah, you know, the thing I know about you is you overcommit and you under underproduce. Sometimes hearing that back from other people gives you that insight. Um, you know, and they talk about it in various ways in, in education and when we're doing evaluations, right? There are these, you know, various reports you're getting from different people, and you're getting different people in your network to give you that feedback about, you know, what you represent and what are your strengths. When that happens, it the more things that triangulate and five different people from five different parts of your life give you the same feedback, you know, it is probably your brand and you have to think about how do you control the brand? Do you want others to control your brand or do you want to take control of it? And I don't know if you've ever tried that, but it's a humbling experience at every level. Yeah, that's actually interesting. It just got me thinking because as, as brutal as that could potentially turn out, Mo, thinking about it, you know, as someone who's pretty still young in their career, I would much rather hear 
something brutal like that now than me just cruise on for the next 15 years and basically be known for, you know, 20 years that that's my brand opposed, opposed to hearing it, you know, in my first few years and, you know, then thinking I, you know, I can change this and, and still have a, a very successful career. So that's important, but then, you know, it's hard to do and it's hard to do for the evaluator too, to, you know, to be brutal to someone like that. But, uh, you know, I think it, it's something that, you know, can be very helpful. It's honesty, right? And the point yeah. is you have to go to people you absolutely trust and, uh, you know, it's never done. Someone who truly, truly is looking out for you. And we all have individuals, I'm sure. And I think some of us serve as that support for other individuals and peers. If they're truly looking out for you, they will tell you exactly the way life is the way they see it. Now you can take it or disagree, but they're telling you not out of malice, not out of anything, but truly um, out of true care for you. Generally people that kind of let things slide, they're the people you have to worry about because they actually have no real vested interest in your future, right? They don't. Um, the people that spend the energy and time and are on you all the time. We've heard that storyline, you know, the teacher that's always on the student and the student says, why are you always on me? Because you have potential right? That kind of storyline. Um, and sometimes you don't want to hear that stuff, but you sometimes need to hear it. And we're only talking negatives. I suspect there's many of us that have a brand that's positive and we don't even know that that's our brand. And we, it'd be helpful to know, Hey, I did not realize those sorts of things. You know, I often, I always focus on the negative and here, thank you for sharing something positive. We tend to give lots of negative feedback or constructive. We don't often give positive feedback. When's the last time you just randomly called somebody and talk to them and giving them a meaningful positive feedback rather than saying you're calling because something hasn't happened, right? That's the other challenge we all have because we're wired that way. True. But it's interesting. I don't know if anybody does martial arts uh, and or sport or coaching that all of this is ingrained in that. Do you know what I mean? Like <clears throat> if I go, <clears throat> if I go up to the dojo and we train, it's constant. Well, not this, 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 this. like it's, it's, it's ingrained. And yet when people come to the operating room or in life, <clears throat> it's not ingrained. It, you know, if I say something negative, I'm, I'm negative or, you know, don't deliver it in exactly the right way. Um, and, and similarly, but I just find it interesting that in other facets of life, martial arts, especially negative, positive feedback is just, it's, it's ingrained. And if, if no one's talking to you about it, if no one gives you negative feedback there, I think I've done something majorly wrong. <laughs> I'm like, why is he not talking to me today? So it's, it's an interesting kind of different parallel universe, I think. No, it is. It is. I mean, um, if anyone has a child or yourself have played any sort of organized sport and at a, at a level that is getting into, you know, serious competition, you know, I'm a hobbyist tennis player, but I see these young 10 and 12 year olds and I see the coaches and I go to the person I'm with and saying, how are they surviving? What's going on to them? And they said, no, it's just, it is, it is the expectation that, you're going to have to go through some stuff, but we're on you because we believe in you. Now, I'm not saying that that's all good and that there isn't abuse and all kinds of things that happen when things go to the extreme, but we also can't be in a, in a world where we are right now, where everybody wins and where everyone is just overtly through a filter of positivity, saying things that aren't necessarily helping that person or individual grow. It starts at childhood all the way up now, but you know, you're seeing it. Yeah. So what are some of the things happening? So I know, I think, Mark, I know you play organized sports. Um, how does this relate to what Brad said to you? Uh, it, the exact same. And um, I've had in the past um, coaches that at the time I thought were absolutely brutal. Um, and looking back, those people probably, you know, shaped me, you know, competitively and in kind of all aspects of life the most for the same reason Brad was saying like they feel like they're relentless with negative constructive feedback and you know like you've said it's for a reason and they see potential and and sometimes when you're young maybe you don't get that right away but the, the sooner you do you realize like they, they are trying to help um, that's been my experience I don't know if others also with sports have went through that 
I the good thing about the sports, uh, sorry, Brad, that you can deal with this negativity uh, very well. So you go to the dojo or you run or you go to the tennis, to the tennis court and you lose and you being like humiliated and you just, that's okay. So when you are like in your up career, you can manage better than the others that haven't experienced these things. I think that's fair. That's actually really fair. That's a good point. I have a question uh, slightly to the next, you know, when we were talking about plateaus and I think <clears throat> Mo and I have had conversations about this. When, when have I reached a spot and it's okay to just be in a plateau? I've, you know, I've been there, I've done it, I'm happy to work and this is it. Or should I always be writing my list and pushing it to the next? You know, it's that concept of, trying to, to get something or just being happy with what we have. Should we ever be there happy with what we have? How, how do we work that? Do you know what I mean? Well, I would say that would be a very sad life, as short as it is, um, never to be happy. So I would say that uh, there's gonna be a point at which you're gonna, in my own mind, but right or wrong, at which you're going to, and I go back to that document, that word and say, is this enough? Now, if your document says, I'm every day improving, well, then you're consistent with your vision by improving. But if, you're, if your vision is, I want to be the following two or three things, and you put those in a clear thing, your personal well-being, your, your interaction with others, however you have relationships, and then ultimately your career, that's it. And you can be at peace with that. I mean, in fact, if anything, you might be at peace with doing less and less and less, if that's your goal. You know, we keep thinking we have to add on, right? But what if our goal should be to do less and less and less and less, and ultimately, you know, in the true Buddhist psychology, be nothing, right? right? One with the river, as they one say. with the river, yeah. So it just depends on. I think it's so unique. Like so, for all of us to talk and think about it, you have to be reflecting on what it means to you, because my vision for me and my vision for you may not be consistent with your vision for you and what you think of me. So it's just, it's a tough call. It's easier for us, uh, I mean, some of us who are into their fifth decade of life and you, you can look back, uh, but when you're earlier on, right, they often say, well, you know, you can say all these things now because you've done all that, right? And we say, but we made a lot of mistakes, don't follow our rules. But they said, because of those mistakes, you are who you are. Well, yeah, okay, good point, right? So it's a circular argument. If you never let someone make a mistake, how do they learn? You know, you know more that one thing that I believe that uh, the thing about being unhappy is when you don't do a, a good transition. Like mm -hmm. you are in mid career, you can go into late career, and then you don't realize that you are turning another person. And then you say, "Oh, I am, I am stuck. At, I'm, I'm not feeling happy with the way that I am." And then you try to get back, and you don't have the same energy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for all of us. You know, you have to have something that drives you, right? Um, and you have to have maybe many things that drive you, but whatever those, if you're not feeling that, then you've got to figure that out carefully. And the worst part about it though is, we often know that we have to let go of things sometimes to be happier, yet we, the hardest thing is to let go, right? The hardest thing is to let go. Because um, we adopt things very quickly and then we just stick with them too long. I mean, and we should, you know, they always say the opposite, right? It should be hire people slowly and fire them fast. Take on a new project very carefully and slowly to see if it matches. And if it doesn't work, get rid of it and move on. It's the really rational thing. We do it backwards. We jump onto things and we never let go of them. And we have all this quote baggage that we just can't get rid of. We're walking like a tourist with, you know, 40 kilos of stuff on us and you just gotta get rid of it, right? Metaphorically. I like that one. I'm going to use that actually. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to force people to speak. I know there's, you know, I appreciate those of you who are on video, but you know, Prab, I mean, Diane, Sergio, I, I see iPad to Niels. I don't want to make a say, but any of you have a thought. Yeah. Any, any comments, anything, any reflections? Hello. I've seen, I've seen oh yes. Yeah. Sergio. Yeah, yeah. Sergio, hello, everybody. Hi. I, I'm from Brazil, and it's a pleasure to, to be with you tonight. 
and it's very interesting to talking you having today. Uh, one thing I th I think it's very interesting, and it's my experience, and it's about the plateau. It's not a just a question to be happy or to be sad. I have a, a great experience. I, I was a football doctor here for a, a great team for 17 years, and it was very good, very nice for every time. And what it's interesting is that you keep in the automatic pilot, literally. That's that's it. And you go, and you when you see you, it has gone 10, 15 years at the same at the same way. And nowadays we hear just uh, exactly different that you have to practice as you are talking tonight. We have to do. Uh, new things, even the things going small. We hear you have to just change your watch for your your wrist, and uh, go to the work for a, a, a new way. And and those things make difference. Imagine big things, new experience, uh, a lot of things that can really change another people lives and even our life. It's very interesting. Now I can have a, a experience. I'm working uh, as a, a volunteer in a special Olympic International. I don't know if you have heard about this. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, right. Yeah, it's very interesting. You you, you see new people. You make a new networking, as as Fabio told uh, earlier, and it's very interesting. We have really, we have really every day to look for for uh, look for new things to to learn to do and. Every day we can be a student. That's it. Yeah, love that. Thank you. In the, in the, in the, in the final minutes, give uh, Fabio and, and maybe the last word here. Then. Yes, we we have approached the hour. Very good. Um, yeah, thank you all. But I'll let, uh, as Brad said, maybe. Uh, Vinny and Fabio have a few last words before we close out for the evening. And if there's anyone else who wants to make a comment, please do so before they start. If not, we totally understand. Uh, I'd like, uh, I'd like to everybody thank for being with us. Uh, it was a pleasure, like to see what you guys thinks about that, uh, and maybe we we made like good conversation. Thanks, and let you probably speak a little bit. Yeah. Thanks uh, everyone for being here tonight. It was a great pleasure to join this discussion and this uh, talk tonight. So majorly, like I feel that uh, we all uh, need to know uh, that we can be happy. And then uh, we have to have our own like personal statement and see what we, uh, we are looking for. And then you also, as Vidi said, you need to transition over time and understand uh, that uh, things evolve and then you need to be more creative to be happy in other aspects of life as well. I mean, I couldn't say it better. Um, I would simply say that, you know, it's, a, it's been an interesting um, discussion and sometimes you don't get this discussion in a webinar format. So, you know, we were very deliberate to keep it small. I invited a few people even to come in because I figured if, even if you don't say anything, you'll probably be able to absorb some of these comments uh, and reflect on them. And hopefully you'll make a change. I mean, I, I see, you know, there's some folks here who are, who are bit visually looking in quietly. I see Sam Miller, I see Alex and Rob and a few others who are, you know, probably reflecting and I hope you all will um, and, and work with us in that way. But, oh, someone said, someone literally wants to come in right now as we're closing, but we'll let them in. We'll let them in and we'll say goodbye <laughs> as soon as they come in. But the point is, um, it's been a, a really, really um, important discussion. We'll have the video available for everyone. Um, and maybe I'll leave Brad with the final word. Go ahead, Brad. No, I just wanted to thank you both for uh, um, just with the presentations, you know, as, as uh, academics, we don't often get a chance to just sit and discuss things like this. And, and I, I think that's the absolute most important to let us all know that, hey, you know, these are things that we all think about and uh, th they impact us on a daily basis, whether we're at work or at home. So I just really appreciate it and want to thank you so much for doing it.